Well, hello, church. It is good to get to be with you on this beautiful day today. I'm loving the fall time. I don't know about you, but I am so thrilled that we get to continue on through this prayer series together. Uh, We believe that God wants to connect with you through prayer. He wants you to experience more peace and hope and goodness and fullness. And part of that is a byproduct of growing closer to him through prayer. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to spend a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a couple of announcements. We'll spend some time worshiping through music, and then we'll spend some time through the Word together today. A couple things that we just want you to be in the know about is that we got some fun, exciting things coming up. Uh, During October, we typically do a outreach event called Trunk or Treat. And this year, the way we're going to be doing that is we're partnering with the city and we're going to have some booths at Bohemia Park with a bunch of other businesses in the community where we give um, our community an opportunity to enjoy enjoy the day and have some candy and just tell our community that we love them and we're part of showing them love. So that's going to take place on Friday, October 29th from 3 to 6 in Bohemia Park. Uh, Here's what we need from you. Um, If you want to help out Hand Candy that day, uh, we ask you to um, give us a call or send us an email. We're going to kind of set up some shifts for people to help out with that. Uh, Just let us know that you'd like to help out in that way. Uh, We also need people to donate money so we can get the candy. If you want to be able to do that, you can uh, just uh, be specific to mark your donation for Trunk or Treat and send that to the church. Another great way you can help is be a part of our candy packing party. We're going to have that the Sunday before, which is um, on October 24th, directly after service. We're going to set up some tables in the gym and everything and uh, provide some candy stuffing stations so that the candy's all good to go to hand out to the kids that day. So um, those are all ways that you can help out. If you want to be a part of the event, send us an email or give us a phone call. If you would like to um, donate financially, you can do that. Or you could also be a part of the candy stuffing aspect of it the week before. So um, just give us a call or send us an email if you want to be a part of it. We would love for you to be a part of it in that way. Um, Also just want you to know that uh, in addition to that, we also have opportunities for you to give um, through your tithes and offerings today. Uh, If you're a guest, you're under no obligation to give. It's just a way that people who call Riverside their home can um, partner that way because everything that we got, God gave us and we give it back to him for him to use for his purposes. Uh, And finally, I just want to say that in case you didn't know, October is Pastor Appreciation Month and today, this Sunday, is actually like the Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Um, I just want to say that because we have a lot of pastors that um, help out here at the church, many of them behind the scenes, and it's a tough job. You deal with a lot of stuff being a pastor. It's not always easy. So um, I just invite you to reach out and um, show your appreciation to a pastor today. We have Pastor Kyle, you know, who works with our youth, and Karen, with our uh, uh, who works with our, our kiddos and stuff, and Aaron, who leads the worship and everything, and Hank, who um, does pastoral care for us. Uh, We have several people here who really do amazing, amazing work, and I would just invite you to reach out to them with some encouragement and just uh, just as a way to bless them. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful way that you can just uh, offer encouragement to somebody. Uh, Not begging for it, but I never turn down encouragement either, so. (laughs) however you want to do that. Uh, It's also an opportunity to just really thank people who have made an impact in your life. Maybe the pastor who brought you to Jesus. Maybe the pastor who um, helped you learn more about Jesus. It's just a way that you can show gratitude and appreciate those who've come before you. And you know, all of us have had people who have poured into us, so all of us should find someone to appreciate. Uh, I just encourage you to do that this month as we celebrate that. Uh, Church, I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then we're going to get into music today. And I just invite you to open up yourself up to what God wants to say to you today. Father God, we come before you today and just ask that you would uh, work in this service, God. Speak to our hearts, teach us how to pray, and help us experience your love and your goodness in everything that we do. We love you, we thank you, we give you everything that we are today. And it's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Won't you join us as we worship today? Calmed and broken 
You know, prayer can be confusing. Maybe that's one of the biggest issues you have. I know that's an issue I have sometimes. There's kind of this confusing element to prayer, which is a little bit hard to make sense of. You know, it's kind of like, how do I do it right? Who exactly am I talking to? What names do I use in prayer? Um, what exactly should I pray for? Uh, is there a right way to pray? You know, I'm very much a, um, what's the right way to do this so I can do it correctly kind of person. And um, it can kind of feel like that when we come to prayer sometimes. It can kind of seem a little ambiguous and a little confusing because of it. And, you know, I would imagine you and I aren't alone in thinking that. Uh, you watch television or movies and you have a scene where someone is praying. And uh, often you see that there's a little bit of um, confusion. Sometimes they're not exactly sure who to pray for, who to pray for, or who to pray to, or exactly what they should be praying for. And it can be a little confusing. But, you know, one of the reasons that we're going through this prayer series in October is to kind of demystify that a little bit. Because one of the things we're actually going to see today is that there's a definite who and what to prayer. And Jesus doesn't want it to be a secret. He wants you and I to really know about it so that we can really connect with God in this beautiful way. So if you love prayer, if you don't really like prayer, if prayer's a little confusing to you, if you're not really sure where to start, this is for you. Because we believe that prayer is meant to be something that God wants us to use to get closer to Him and as a byproduct experience more peace, more hope, more love, more wholeness, more goodness. And I want you to experience that today. I want to experience that today. And through looking at some of the words of Jesus, I believe we'll find out some ways we can grow in our prayer life to experience those things together. So as we begin today, we're going to start by reading the Lord's Prayer together. So uh, if you're in your car listening, you can repeat after me. If you're watching right now, let's say this prayer together. It's the prayer that Jesus gives to teach us how to pray. And he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Father God, as we come before you today in your word, speak to us, teach us more about prayer, and help us to be able to see you for who you are and experience your goodness. In your name we pray today. Amen. So today, we're going to begin digging in this prayer, just a couple of lines at a time. And it starts by Jesus saying, this then is how you should pray. That he's not a God who is absent, but he is a God who is present. A God who wants to know you and wants you to know him. Just another chapter later, Jesus says it this way. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus is kind of letting the cat out of the bag that he's not very good at hide and seek. He wants to be known by you. He wants to be known by me. And he doesn't want prayer to be this giant, confusing, ambiguous thing. He wants it to be something where we can genuinely connect with God and know him. How beautiful is that? Jesus says in another section in scripture to kind of illustrate how much he wants to be known. He's talking to a church in the book of Revelation, a church who's kind of not paying attention to him. And he says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal with you together as friends. Jesus doesn't want to be absent. He wants to be present. Jesus wants to be known. And part of the way he does that is through us connecting through prayer. And he doesn't want to just leave us to our own devices. He wants to show us how we can connect with, to God with prayer. Show us how you then pray. And you know, this is really awesome because it gets at this other concept of Jesus. The fact that he was willing to come down to earth in human skin to suffer, to experience the hurt and the pain of the human experience for the very sake of love for you and for me. In the book of John, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. That it was all part of the plan for Jesus to come down, to make himself and to make God known, not make God hidden. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus wants us to experience God through prayer. And this is one of the ways that he does it, by showing us how to pray. And you know, one of the questions we might have when we see that is, okay, so is Jesus going to have us just rehearse some stale prayers? To which I would say no. 
One of the most important aspects of prayer is God wants your heart to be a part of it. Whether you're saying prayers that are in scripture or whether you're saying your own prayers. Jesus here is not so much giving us a stale script that he wants us to read from. He's giving us a framework through which we build the rest of the prayers throughout our life. I'm going to say that again. He's not giving us a stale script. He's giving us a framework. There's a difference. You give someone a script when you don't really want them to do anything about it, right? Instead, you give someone a framework when you want them to be able to put their own heart and creativity into it. When I think of that, I think of cooking. I'm cooking a lot more these days than I used to, and I'm not a very great cook. So when I cook, I go through a recipe and I read it to the T. I'm telling you, I don't want to miss a single step because I don't want dinner to be gross. My wife, on the other hand, is an experienced cook and baker. And so she sees a recipe, and as she sees it, she says, you know, we could add this flavor in here a little bit. We could add a little bit of this ingredient to spice it up and kind of make it our own. That's kind of what Jesus is doing here by teaching us how to pray. He wants to give us a framework, and he is giving us some principles that we should apply to our prayer life, but ultimately we should put our heart into it. And it doesn't mean that we just can have to, like, you know, just staley read off of a script. Even if we're reading through prayers in the Bible to connect with God, God wants our heart to be in it. It gets at this idea in Colossians chapter 3 when the author says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. That serving God and growing closer to him, whether that's through Bible reading or prayer or community or what we're doing in our workplace, we're meant to put our heart into it. And so as Jesus teaches us how to pray, he's giving us a framework for prayer and inviting us to enter in with our whole life and our whole heart. So Jesus then teaches us how to pray and he starts it this way. He says, our father in heaven. This kind of gets at what we talked about last week, that when we approach God and he begins prayer by approaching God this way, we approach him relationally. Not as some absent old man in the sky wanting to lightning bolt you when you've done wrong, but a loving, caring father who has a relationship with you. And you know, for some of us, the idea of God being a father is very, very tough to come to grips with. But part of what God wants to do in his fatherhood is redeem the lack of a father you might have had, or the father who you had but didn't want. That Jesus coming to earth was meant to reveal to us the wonderful, beautiful Father God we're meant to communicate with. And it might be a little difficult addressing him as Father, but as we approach him and get to know him, we open ourselves up to experiencing a redemption of fatherhood that he wants us to experience. And I think it's so important that Jesus starts this way because it reminds us that we're praying to somebody. Not just some random fairy in the sky, not just the clouds. We're praying to someone, our Father God. We often say that we pray to our Father through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That God is one, but God is also three. What? That's this concept that we talk about called the doctrine of the Trinity. This understanding that we serve one God, but this one God is made up in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we are pray, we are meant to be talking to our Father. And the way that we're able to do that is through the fact that Jesus died and rose for our sins, removing sin and opening up the communication lanes between us and our Father. That's why we often say, in Jesus' name, amen, because we're praying through what Jesus has done on our behalf to the Father. And the Holy Spirit, the very one who raised Jesus from the dead, who lives in us when we say yes to Jesus, he is empowering us and teaching us and convicting us and helping empower us in the moment how to pray. Now, I know that can be kind of a confusing concept, right? This idea that God is one and God is three, and there's all these different people involved in prayer. But um, one of the best ways to think about it is to think about it musically, I think. If only there were a guitar around. Well, looky there. I always have a guitar handy, usually. Uh, One of the ways it makes the most sense to me is uh, to think that God is one, but God is three, is to kind of think of God in terms of music. When you, you have music, you have your single notes, right? Even if you're not a musician, you just kind of know that's one note. That's a single note, right? And uh, if you want to make a chord, you have to put notes together. 
But when you put those notes together to make a chord, you don't call it, oh, what chord is that? Oh, it's a C and E and a G. No, you call it by one chord name. It's a C chord. And it's made of three individual, distinct, but harmonious notes. That's a chord. So to think of God as three, but also one, is to think that each member of the Trinity is almost like an individual note. They're co-equal. They're together and unified, but they are distinct. And when you put them together, you get one chord. One chord made out of three unique but co-equal notes. That's kind of the concept of God being three, but God also being one. And as we approach our Father, we know that we're supposed to address our Father in prayer and that all the members of the Trinity are involved in this process, which kind of ties into this idea of our Father, our Father in heaven, not my Father, not your Father, our Father. Now, there is an individual component to it, of course, that I have to be the one who says yes to Jesus, right? But your salvation and your walk of faith can never happen in an individual bubble. That was never the point. God himself is community. God is communal with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in love with each other, all in this beautiful, harmonious dance. How do we think that we can get through life on our own when God himself is a community? Our Father in heaven. We must never forget this idea that God is community, and we're meant to experience him not just individually, but in community as well. And you know, that's an important thing for us all to remember. Because it's so easy to hate. It's so easy to let unforgiveness grip your heart. It's so easy to talk trash about that other person or that other church. But it's a lot harder to do it when you constantly remind yourself through prayer that you're part of a bigger family. That your father, the one you're praying to, that Jesus Christ, the one you're paying, praying through, died for them just like he died for you. And can I say, church, we have too many grumblers and not enough people focused on community. We have too many people who are willing to cancel someone else on Facebook rather than willing to say, you know what, our Father in heaven, that person's my brother and sister. They might be kind of silly right now, but I need to remember that they're my brother and sister in Christ, that I shouldn't just cancel them. I should love them. Doesn't make everyone's decisions good and daisies and rainbows. Sometimes confrontation needs to happen. But we shouldn't engage in gossip or hate or quarreling with our brothers and sisters in Christ because they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are to always remember that. Our Father in heaven. This beautiful concept and reminder that God is not limited by time. He's not limited by space. He's not limited by the weaknesses that we are often limited by. That he is our Father in heaven. A theologian by the name of Wesley Hill puts it this way. He said, Heaven is a word that allows us to speak about God's nearness without pinning him down to a specific geographical address. I love that. That's a great way to think of it. That God is near, he is present, he is relational individually and in community, but he's not stuck in a particular place. Our Father in heaven. That's how Jesus begins this prayer, with a reminder of who who we are praying to, because prayer in and of itself is relational. We must never forget that, that prayer is relational. And starting with the who of prayer helps us remember that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is a beautiful thing because it reminds us that God is our Father, but God is also the all-powerful creator of the universe. This word hallowed is a word that means uh, like holy. May your name be kept holy. This reminder that God is good and relational and he is also holy. You know, holy is this word that means, um, uh, in the original language, it means weighty. It means it holds this weight, this, um, this kind of heaviness, this kind of awe-inspiring heaviness. It means it looks different. It means it's different than the regular things of the world. There's something unique about it, something special about it. God in himself is holy. There is no one like God. Here's a couple verses of what the Bible says about God and his holiness. It says in 1 Samuel, There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Then in Isaiah it says, And the one who called 
to another said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Then in Psalm 96, it says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all of the earth. That God is not just this um, daddy in the sky who's like kind of like, you know, not cool or not powerful. That he is our father, but he's also all powerful, completely holy, set apart, different, awe-inspiring. That's another component that we have to know, that we remember that we can connect relationally to God, but ultimately that God is Lord. That ultimately, uh, when I say yes to Jesus, I ain't the boss of my life. The Lord of the universe is. And I need to keep him in his place of holiness. That's part of what this prayer is. Reminding ourselves that, you know what? I don't get to just call the shots because I feel like it. The Holy Lord of the universe who I've given my life to is the one who calls the shots in my life holy be your name. Don't let me shrink you. Don't let me minimize you. Let me remember how good and holy and mighty and glorious of a God you are. May I never forget that. May I always remember in prayer that you are my father who I can relationally connect with, but you are Lord and you are holy. Understanding God's holiness is such an important aspect to prayer. Because it not only helps us put him in his proper place, but it puts us in our proper place. It means that we don't um, get bent out of shape when we think we need to be the God of something or be in control of everything. It frees us up from being control freaks because God is the ultimate holy Lord who is ultimately in control. Our Father in heaven, the one I have a relationship with, holy be your name. May you can, uh, may I remember to keep you in the place that you truly are as the Lord and King of the universe and of my life. That's the who of prayer, an important thing. We need to worship God and pray to him as he really is and praying to him as our father in heaven saying, holy be your name, hallowed be your name is a reminder for us to keep God as he really is and pray to him and communicate with him and worship him as he truly is. Then he goes on in the next verse to say, your kingdom come, your will be done. You know, if I were to ask you, what does Jesus talk about most in the Bible? There's lots of answers we'd probably get. Oh, love or peace or goodness or healing or things like that, right? More than anything else in the Bible, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming. Because love and peace and wholeness are part of what Jesus does, but it's all under this umbrella of the kingdom that he is building. For Jesus just to show up and be a good teacher doesn't save us. For Jesus just to to show up and save you individually and continue letting the world go to trash, that's great, I guess, but it's not, um, it doesn't really reveal his goodness. Jesus is building a kingdom, a kingdom where his rule, his principles, his love, his wholeness abounds. And as Jesus entered the world years ago, he ushered in that kingdom. Today, that kingdom is continuing to be pushed out by Jesus' church. And one day, it will come to full completion when Jesus returns. And when we pray to God, we got to start with who God is. And before we start praying about how Betty was mean to me or how I need this or how I need this, we start by saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. Because if God is Lord, if he is holy, if he is the ultimate, that means his priorities take precedence over mine. And that's kind of hard to believe sometimes or think about sometimes because we're really self-obsessed a lot. But we need to pray for his kingdom come and his will to be done. Because here's the deal. If we allow the kingdom of God to be built in our lives, in our families' lives, in our work lives, he's going to be building the ultimate thing that we need. It's easy to get bent out of shape and think, no, 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 God, I want this. But if it's not building God's kingdom, it's really not in your best interest. Because the things that we build on our own are eventually going to crumble. But the things that Jesus is building will remain as long as he has his hands on them. And so many of us approach our days, our work life, our family life, not by saying, God, may your kingdom come and your will be done. But we say, how can I build my kingdom? 
How can I make my family look the way I want it to? How can I make my work life look the way I want it to? How can I make my personal life, my financial life, my sex life look the way that I want it to? But when Jesus teaches us how to pray, he's saying that's not how you start praying. You start by praying, by remembering who God is, and then you continue on in prayer after that saying, you know what, God, your kingdom over mine, your will and preference over mine. Here's a couple things that Jesus says about his kingdom. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That we are meant to pursue God's kingdom and God's will over our own. But the thing is, all things will be given to you. That when we do that, we're putting our lives in the proper place and allowing Jesus to really impact us the way he wants to. How often do we shoot ourselves in the foot and keep us from moving forward because we're so caught up trying to build our kingdom and not even listening to how Jesus wants to build his, him knowing that as soon as we start building his, we're actually going to align ourselves with the right way of living because God is building something. God is building a kingdom where he wants to see people healed, people transformed, people experiencing his love, darkness being pushed out. That's what God wants to build. And we will never experience satisfaction and contentment, church, unless we all get on board with building that kingdom first over our own. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that a beautiful thought to think that God has a will? That God wills and wants and desires things? That this good father who loves you wills and wants and desires for you to be a part of building his kingdom so you can really experience peace, so that you can really experience contentment, so that you can really experience him in his fullness as you get on board with what he is doing. When we come to prayer, we're meant to connect with God relationally, the who of prayer. Then when we get to the what of prayer, it's your kingdom come, your will be done. God cares about your needs. We're going to get to that um, in a future sermon. But we must begin with your kingdom come and your will be done because that's going to give you your best family life, your best financial life, your best sex life, your best relational life. It all starts with God's kingdom come and his will be done. And then for the last scripture we're going to cover today with these first couple chunks, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's easy to think that Jesus is just building this spiritual kingdom, right? This spiritual kingdom that we'll see one day but won't really impact my daily life, right? But here's the deal that Heaven represents the place where God's perspectives and everything and his power, where everything reigns, where the kingdom is going how it's supposed to go, right? But he's building it on earth right now. We're asking for the, the way that we, Jesus is planning on his kingdom, looking when all is complete, that that breaks into the present now. That's part of why Jesus shows up in the middle of history rather than just at the end of history. He's saying the kingdom's breaking in now. That healing can happen now in your marriage, in your family life, in your bank account, in your work life. Healing can happen now. And God's kingdom can begin taking root in your life right now. Now it'll come to its fullness at that day that Jesus comes back. But today, right here, right now, we are to pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven right now. A current reality that we are praying and working toward. How beautiful is that? That Jesus loves you so much that he doesn't want you just to wait until this far off time where everything is going to be brought to fruition. He's giving it to us now. Now it'll be in totality eventually, but we're getting a piece of it now as he works, as his kingdom moves forward. Jesus wants us to not only connect with the who of prayer, but the what of prayer, which involves his kingdom come and his will be done on earth, in our families, in our workplace, in our bank accounts as it is in heaven. And that kind of perspective helps us to know that we are stewards of what we have right now. 
That the family that God has given us, that the finances God has given us, that the job and the time God has given us, that we are to steward it well for God's kingdom and for his will. And like it says in Matthew 6, 33, when we seek his kingdom and righteousness, all things will be given to you as well. If we want to live our purpose out more, we need to reorient everything around Jesus and his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Doesn't mean every day is daisy and rainbows, but it does mean that we are working towards something that will last and we are operating the way we were intended to operate when we ask for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's just a couple of verses, right? Not a lot of verses, just a couple of verses, but there's so much meat to them. And this begins the framework that God wants us to begin operating in as we enter into prayer. That we start with the who and the what of prayer. We start with our Father who is in heaven, who is completely and totally holy, and we pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done in, on earth as it is in heaven, in our lives as it is in heaven. We look at this chunk of the Lord's Prayer, and what it really wants to communicate to you and me today is that a thriving life of prayer invites us to look upward before we look inward. That there is a time to talk about our needs, that God wants us to give him our needs and our desires and approach him with our feelings and our heart. We're going to go over that in the next couple of weeks. But so often we struggle in our prayer life when we start that way because we're looking at how big the problems are before we look at how big God is. We look at how small and inconvenienced we are when we look at that first, rather than looking at how grand and glorious and powerful God actually is. If we want our prayer lives to thrive, if we want to experience the deep, relational, intimate, powerful prayer life that God wants us to, the invitation is for us to live this thriving prayer life by beginning by looking upward rather than inward. There is a time for that. God wants that. But when we start with God, we're opening ourselves up to experience his peace and his wholeness and his fillness the way that he intends. So what do we do with this? Here's what I would have us do. How many of us actually get our days started focusing on God and his kingdom? I was a little convicted of that this week. I was going through a devotional and it was saying, what's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? Is it God? Is it his kingdom? Is it his ways? Or are you thinking about how you're late or your alarm's going off or how the cat's yelling at you or whatever, right? What's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? What's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? I'm so tempted so often to just go, 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 go. And next thing I know, it's 10 o'clock. I'm stressed out of my gourd because I haven't focused on our loving relational father who's in charge of it all or his kingdom. So here's what I would invite us all to do this week. When your alarm goes off, before you read the news, before you look at your phone, before you look at social media, before you get up and go on, before you take a shower, just... Pray this to God in bed before you get up. Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Where you're just opening yourself up to God, thinking about how grand he is and thinking about his kingdom before your own. I invite you that that's what we do with that this week. Start our day as soon as you hit that alarm. Just say that quick prayer. Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then if you have a couple more seconds, just take it even a little bit further. God, may your kingdom be a part of everything in my life today. Let your kingdom be a part of everything in my wife or my husband's life today. Let your kingdom come in my kid's life, in my work life, in my bank account, God. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Because the beautiful thing is, is that the Bible says that when Jesus died for us, he made us co-heirs with him. 
that Jesus is this king over this kingdom that he invites us into, and that we get to be part of the royal family because of what he has done. That one day, when all is said and done, this will be the kingdom that we all operate in, where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more frustration. We will be operating in this perfect, complete kingdom he has built, full of peace and full of love and full of goodness and full of wholeness. Why would we not participate in building that now when we know that's where we're going to end up? Why not allow the opportunity for that goodness and wholeness and peace and goodness to enter into our lives today? Jesus gave up his life for you so that you could be brought into that kingdom and begin participating in it today through a relational life with the Father. How beautiful is that? You've been redeemed by the King of Kings, brought into a beautiful relationship, and invited to be in part of the kingdom work today. As we pray, the who and the what of prayer, remembering how God has brought us into that, may we be spurred on to expand this kingdom in every area of our lives, that we would follow King Jesus and allow ourselves to be completely and radically transformed by his goodness and his grace. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you. God, we come before you and we thank you for the opportunity that we get to worship you and come to you in prayer. God, we simply pray today your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that you are our Father who is in heaven and that your name would be kept holy. May that be true for us today. May this be a new framework upon which we look at prayer and may our lives be transformed as we seek to live it out for you, Father God. We love you and thank you, and it's in your holy and precious name that we pray today. Amen. Church, it's so good to be with you. I pray that you do well as you go out this week, and that as you pray for our Father in heaven to uh, impact your life, for his kingdom to come and his will to be done, that you would live radically transformed lives, and that the peace that comes with the kingdom in Jesus would flood your lives this week. We love you, church. We'll see you next week.